Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation. This is this week's issue of the Libertarian Angle. I'm joined by my co-host, Richard Ebelin, who teaches economics at the Citadel. Richard, welcome back. It's good to be with you once again and yeah, to our listeners and viewers. Yeah, kind of sad. We wrapped up our eight-part series on history of economic thought. So we're <laughs> – hey, at least it stopped at eight. didn't go to about 160, you know. Uh, That's that, what I had planned, <laughs> but, but, but you, you wouldn't go along with it. Well, I thought it really ended up a nice little series for people who – wanted a broad overview, kind of a lay of the land on history of economic thought. We got a lot of nice comments, so it's all up there on our on our website at fff.org. But we're going to visit a new theme, a theme that's popping up in political circles, uh, namely the GOP presidential race, and that's a concept of economic fascism. Now, we, we hear a lot about socialism, and we have for many years, you know, the socialism of the welfare state and central planning as manifested by such programs like Social Security and Medicare, Medicaid, corporate bailouts, farm subsidies. The whole idea of, of using the state, the coercive apparatus of the government, to take money from one group of people in order to give it to another group of people. Sort of a, a variation on Marxian theory of from each according to ability to each according to need. And then there's the central planning agencies like the Federal Reserve, uh, centrally planning the monetary sphere, and there's public schooling where they plan the educational decisions of of millions or thousands of children, but we very rarely hear about fascism. And so Richard and I thought, well, this will be an interesting subject to bring up because it's being brought up in the context of Donald Trump's campaign. People on the left, as well as people on the right, are saying that he has fascist proclivities. So what does that mean? Well, Richard, the way I look at it is that fascism sort of has a, uh, a, a dimension that is, is not much different in principle from the socialist concept. I mean, socialism in the modern sense, in the welfare state sense, uh, they, they've essentially nationalized people's income, and they decide how this income is going to be distributed so that, oh, you, you have to share with the elderly with Social Security, so we're going to take a share of your income and do that, and Medicare, Medicaid, corporate bailouts, farm subsidies. So effectively, the government decides what is going to happen with your income. Well, with fascism, and in the pure socialist sense, that's where the state just nationalizes everything, like it did in Cuba, where the, the state owns the means of production. So there, there's obviously a, a scale of gradation there. Uh, but and with fascism, the state permits people to retain privately owned property, but then tells them this is what you're going to do with it. Uh, so it has the trappings of a private property order, which libertarians favor, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's directing people what they have to do with their money, or they, they manipulate them into doing what they want with their money, like with tax deductions, tax credits, and the like. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in, in principle, it seems to me that the two systems are exactly the same. You've got government either uh, taking a person's income and deciding what to do with it or leaving the person free to keep the income but then telling him what he's going to do with it. What do you think, Richard? Well, I think that, that you're right. The, the, the term fascism uh, is one that crops up on both the left and the right. It's bandied, uh, bandied about. Uh, uh, not surprisingly, it is almost always used uh, as a, in a pejorative sense that to label uh, one's opponents as fascist is to uh, mark them with, with some indication of depravity and evil. And, of course, that all has to do with the experiences uh, uh, during the Second World War where uh, fascism in the form of Mussolini's Italy and, of course, uh, Nazi Germany under Hitler uh, – espouse such an imagery of a fascist system, uh, bringing death and destruction and mass murder to so many. So therefore, to be branded as a fascist is to be branded as, as a sort of a, an ideological and political and human pariah. Uh, but ideas do have histories. And uh, maybe uh, it would be worthwhile for me to take a few minutes, Jacob, 
to sort of explain the historical context of the emergence of fascism and along the lines that you were alluding to just a few minutes ago of the content and structure of how the advocates of fascism saw the social and political and economic system. Uh, there was no modern fascist movement until uh, immediately after the First World War. Uh, it was developed and organized by an Italian named Benito Mussolini, who I assume most of the uh, listeners and viewers have heard of. Uh, in fact, Mussolini was one of the most prominent socialists in Italy before the First World War. He, in fact, was the editor of the leading socialist newspaper, Avante. Uh, he was considered a, 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 a dominant spokesman uh, for the socialist and, indeed, the Marxian conception of uh, a revolutionary change. Uh, but uh, during and following the, the First World War, uh, Mussolini did not give up his collectivist premises or themes, uh, but merely transformed sort of the, the template of them. Uh, he said that Italy, rather than being uh, submerged into a Marxian-type class conflict, the proletarians against the capitalists, the workers versus the owners, uh, what Italy needed was common unification to restore the national greatness of the country. And in this, what one should see is not an eternal and inescapable conflict between workers and capitalists, but between nation states. Uh, the, 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 the empires of Britain and, and France, for instance, uh, in opposition to an Italy weaker and restrained uh, from, from, from its potential for national greatness, a restoration of national greatness. And in the fascist template, as he presented it, uh, and gaining support and then finally coming to power in Italy in 1922, uh, he said that the ideal is to realize that, that, that all Italians, the citizens of any nation state, have far more in common than they have uh, against each other. In, in, in the new, in the new uh, national greatness of a fascist Italy, there is a place for all members of the society, workers, merchants, retailers, business uh, executives, uh, 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 capitalists. But what has to be rejected, and in this he follows his, his, his general collectivist theme, is that society always runs the risk of the interests of the individual coming into conflict with the interests of the nation as a whole. And therefore, to the extent that business is permitted, retail enterprise is allowed. Uh, there are, are, are the remaining markets for agricultural and manufacturing and industrial goods. The actions of each member of the society must be made subservient and obedient and limited to those things that would serve the interests of the society as a whole. Nothing bef uh, instead of the state nothing above the state, nothing outside of the state. That's a phrase, almost paraphrasing, well, almost literally a phrase from a, a famous essay that Mussolini wrote on the philosophy of fascism. The, the, the individual is a cog in the wheel of the society. He must serve the interests of the nation state to which he belongs, because that is the primordial and essential element that gives him life, identity, meaning, and will continue that, 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 that meaning and purpose through the posterity of later generations. Individuals pass away. The nation state and the people as a whole go on. Uh, for this reason, uh, uh, Mussolini said, everything must fit within a structured plan that serves the interest of the nation as a whole. So uh, within a few years after him coming to power, and uh, uh, basically as a response to what was viewed as a threat by socialists and communists. There they were communists uh, who, who radical Marxists inspired by what was going on under Lenin in the Soviet Union, who were occupying factories, uh, ra having rally rallies and demonstrations, trying to seize control of cities through violent and, and physical means. And uh, he, he, Mussolini garnered uh, parts of the, of the workers, plus middle class merchants who felt that their their retail stores and businesses and life were being threatened. Uh, wealthier people who, who uh, may not have liked Mussolini, but they disliked the idea of uh, ca communists taking over their businesses and killing them more. Uh, so as a consequence, he bound together all of these different groups together and then designed uh, an economic program or agenda that would fit this, which he called the corporativist state. Now, in fact, the, this notion of the corporativist state uh, Jacob went back earlier in time. 
Uh, it was revived in the in, at the beginning of the 1920s. That is right after the First World War, not in Italy under Mussolini himself, but by British socialists, and particularly a couple known as Beatrice and Sidney Webb, who later came to be apologists and and and, and adulators for for Soviet for, for so, the Soviet Union under Stalin. But but in 1919, 1920, they published a book on on a new constitution for Great Britain. And what they proposed was a system of guild socialism. Uh, rather than capitalism uh, with the rough and tumble and greed of, of profit-motivated businessmen at the expense of, of workers and consumers, uh, society should be organized in guilds, that is, professional uh, associations representing each trade, occupation, industry, form of work. And these guilds would then, within themselves, decide the production the standards of, uh, and pricing of the products that they sold uh, to others in the society. And, in fact, it was this mo model of a guild socialism that, that out of which Mussolini developed his idea of corporativism. So by the middle of the 1920s and early 1920s, both in terms of a template of a policy and then a, a beginning of an impl implementation, uh, Mussolini uh, said that the fascist economic state is one in which every business, every industry, every profession, every occupation, every commercial undertaking based upon its quality and type is organized into a government mandated cartel. Uh, every steel manufacturer, every textile manufacturer, uh, every retail store uh, owner, all the way, every business, trade and industry would be forced into a government mandated cartel. Workers would be organized in government mandated trade unit unions reflecting the industry or trade in which they had employment. And these, and these co corporativist entities, these government mandated cartels and compulsory unions, they would then, with government oversight and overseeing from the top down, if you will, would then determine prices, wages, work conditions, what would be produced, how it would be, we, how it would be produced, where, when, for whom in terms of what would be sold, and the prices and the wages that would be paid for products and, and for the wages of workers. And by this method, one could have all of the benefits of a, of a, of a planned and directed economy without the, the social disruption uh, of, of, of Marxian uh, revolution, which would, as part of its agenda, would eradicate businessmen and capitalists and enterprises who, when properly restrained and combined within the needs of the state, have a useful role to play to serve the greater good of the nation. And so that became his model. Uh, it was an extremely popular model in, in, in the United States as well. I know you know some of this history, Jacob, but for some of our, our listeners and viewers, in, 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 with the coming of the Great Depression, there were those in the United States, including senior executives such as a Mr. Gerald Swope, S-W-O-P-E, who was the head of the General Electric Corporation, who advocated that type of an economic system. That is, that you don't have the radicalism of Marxism. We have to do away with, 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 with the rough and, and, and tumble and greedy and exploitive aspects of unregulated capitalism to have this middle ground that Mussolini was offering the world, where you don't do away with capitalism, you harness, restrain, and control capitalism through these government-mandated cartels. And, you, and workers are not left on their own, they, 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 are, they are taken care of and, and, and watched over through these government-mandated trade unions. And then with the state overseeing and planning everything, there's a harmony among the classes and the interests of the society to advance and further the good of the nation uh, as a whole in itself. Uh, as a consequence, there, there, there were many who advocated that system in the United States. It became the model for the first New Deal. That is, when Franklin Roosevelt came into office during his first 100 days, the famous 100 days of all this dramatic legislation, a key element of it was the National Recovery Administrative Administration. And, and what this was meant precisely was to put government industry and government-mandated cartels. And uh, with government permission and oversight, the cartels would set production levels, uh, determine and manage prices, and uh, and th and, and uh, and work condition and wages, and then agriculture had its own version, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, where, where farmers were, 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 were managed by the state. Farms were not taken over. Uh, farming remained in private hands, but the government determined what crops could be grown, 
what livestock could be raised, uh, the quantities of food and, and, and livestock that could be offered on the market, and the prices at which they could be sold. And this became the, the, a, a dominant ideal uh, and, 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 and framework at that time. Now, essential to this, obviously, and a particular aspect uh, that Mussolini and then Hitler gave to this, because Hitler introduced this as well uh, in, in between 1933 and 1936 after he came to power. By 1936, uh, Nazi Germany had implemented their own version of fascist planning. The Soviet Union under Stalin may have had five-year plans, but in Nazi Germany under Hitler, the economy was confined and straitjacketed within government four-year plans. Anything the communists could do in five years, we the National Socialists could do in four. Uh, the, the other element of this was an implicit uh, uh, reduction and confining of human activity within the confines of government mandates. Uh, in other words, forms of tyranny inescapably accompany such types of fascist and economic fascist policies. Why? Well, either individuals can express their own values and preferences and desires with all their complexity and diversity through their individual and intricate trading in the marketplace with other willing buyers and sellers, or all must have their hierarchy of values and desires confined and straitjacketed within the imposed hierarchy of values that the government plans, uh, plan, whether it's of communist or this fascist type, imply. This is what will be produced in these quantities for these members of the society. These will be the work conditions. These will be the opportunities, not the ones that you might want to pursue and hopefully achieve in the free arrangements with others in the marketplace, but your hierarchy of values and desires must be limited to and made to fit within the hierarchy of values expressed in the fascist plan, just like in the, in the Soviet communist plan. So that inevitably re reduces freedom to the limits of what serves and, and fits within what the government wants in its corporativist model of directing the economy. Now, now of course, that, that was the extreme form of the Jacob. Um, that, that in one sense, that, that was said to be uh, uh, you know, done away with in, 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 in the ashes of the Second World War. Mussolini's regime was overthrown. Uh, Hitler committed suicide in the bunker, and that's ended uh, very shortly, the, the Nazi regime. But, in fact, variations on a fascist-type model has remained implicitly a more modified and, and less comprehensive ideal in much of what government does today. The government doesn't own the means of production. But through these intricate and complex and, and all-embracing networks of regulations, basically confines and therefore in with the narrow corridor corridors directs what how businessmen can produce, where they can produce, who they can hire, under what wages and work conditions, uh, what prices they can charge, uh, what, what innovations they can introduce. So that in a sense, in many, in, in, in a sense, in many ways, what we live under inescapably is sort of a, 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 a modified and, and, quote, democratically uh, uh, mild uh, system of economic fascism that has its, has its origin in the more extreme totalitarian types uh, of the interwar period. Yeah, I, I, I... When we talk about corporatism and the left talks about corporatism, we're really talking about this fascist model, this combination of business and the state, uh, where, where business and Wall Street, they get in bed with the state, and then when they need a bailout, it's there, and there's these revolving doors where government officials go there to these other companies when they retire from government service. And I'm glad you brought up uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the Great Depression. You know, we're all indoctrinated in our public government schools with the notion that FDR's New Deal was a free enterprise reform. It saved free enterprise. It was really the opposite. It was the abandonment of America's free market system in favor of a socialist type system. That's what social security was all about. But it was also a fascist type system. And the National Recovery Administration, which had been brought into existence as a result of the National Industrial Recovery Act, uh, was a classic model of fascism. Uh, as you point out, you had these cartels, businesses and industries were encouraged or mandated to 
to come together with codes that established prices and wages and working conditions. And all of this was had the ostensible trappings that the private sector was doing this. But it was really the government. They had the government force behind them. And, uh, Richard, you know about the infamous Blue Eagle campaign where, you know, yes. Roosevelt had a retired military general. <laughs> Not surprising. This was a fascist program. And he was running. Hugh Johnson was his name. He was running this program. And he comes up with this emblem called the Blue Eagle where businesses were, were encouraged to, to post in their storefront windows a copy of the Blue Eagle. And it was a creepy, eerie thing, but it's like straight out of the of the fascist playbook. And if an American businessman said, I don't want to have any part of this, they'd go on a campaign to ostracize him, boycott him, because he wasn't getting with the program. And I'm glad also that you brought up uh, Nazi Germany, because here, here you have a party that calls itself National Socialist. But in large part, their model, their economic model was fascism. And um, a lot of Americans don't know that Hitler sent Roosevelt a letter through the, through the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador, that says, I want to commend you on what you're doing there in the United States, because what you're doing is exactly what we're doing. And he was being very sincere, because he was leading Germany out of the Great Depression, too, and on to greatness. And his model was, well, what he told Roosevelt was, I'm glad that you agree with me that the public wheel comes before the private interests. In other words, what matters is society and, and the, the good of society, not the individual liberty of, of individual citizens. And, and then bringing it up to today, Richard, I, you know, we also have to look at what conservatives call for a lot. You know, like in the big Social Security debate, we libertarians would say repeal it. I mean, that's a free society when you keep everything you earn and you decide what to do with it. Not where the state's taking your money and giving it to seniors and not where the state's ordering you to do something with your money. But that's what conservatives have done. They've proposed a Social Security model that really is modeled after the fascist economic dictatorship of, of uh, General Augusto Pinochet in Chile, where they say, well, no, our model is better than the socialist model. We will let you keep your money, but then the government will mandate you to, to put a certain uh, uh, amount aside in savings in government-approved uh, investment vehicles. In other words, Wall Street again. Uh, so, I mean, we libertarians really do stick out. I mean, we, we, by our allegiance to a free society and a free market society, one where we say leave people free to decide what to do with their own money, charity, uh, donations, uh, savings, uh, expenditures, investment, that that's really the only kind of society that's consistent with a free society, not the socialist model or the fascist model. I agree. I think that part of the problem in getting people to understand this and to realize that many facets of what has come to be called crony capitalism, as you were alluding to a couple of minutes ago, these, these business partnerships, these government business partnerships, the, these uh, re relationships that are established uh, through administrations, whether it be Democratic or, or, or Republican, through what is referred to as, you know, the, 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 the K Street lobbyist, uh, you know, where lo all these lobbyists have their offices, I gather, and to a great extent in Washington, D.C., uh, that all of these are forms in a more decentralized fashion than the rigid top-down fascist or, or sort of central planning model. But all of these are, are sort of decentralized networks of government planning through favors and privileges for various sectors of, 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 of the, the business community. Uh, one of the most difficult things to get people to understand, but being difficult is non, nonetheless profoundly important, is to get people to realize that we do not live under a free market capitalist system. Are there elements of competitive enterprise? Yes. You know, the, you, you go out in the market, and there's more than one supermarket, and they have product competition as well as price competition. But the fact is, is that whatever degrees of competition and market openness continue to prevail and exist in a country like the United States, it is in the wider setting of these regulatory and interventionist spiders web, net, spiders webs of, of control, favoritism, subsidies, protections, anti-competitive and, and pro-monopoly regulations. 
So, so, so that rather than one man like Mussolini or a Hitler commanding, this is the target and this will be done. It's sort of like fascism from the bottom up through the wheeling and dealing and the corruptions of, of these interest groups buying a politician, this politician selling because he wants votes and campaign contributions, and, and these intricate webs of, of, of regulation control and, 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 uh, and, and corrupting uh, networks between businesses and other special interests and government, all at the expense of the consuming public and those who would be potential and productive rivals if markets were not closed or as regulated as they are in comparison to an open field of of supply side competition. Yeah, and I, I think we should also remind our viewers that, of what happened with that National Industrial Recovery Act because there was a real ideological battle taking place in the 30s. I mean, remember, this was the time when conservatives had not yet made peace with the welfare state and the regulated economy. They were still battling, and that battle was taking place also in the Supreme Court. Uh, it was an ideological battle, it was a moral battle, and it was a constitutional battle. And the, yes. there were those that were battling and saying, this is an alien way of life. It's a fascist yes. way of life, and therefore it, it violates the constitution of this country. It violates the established system that the framers brought into existence. And sure enough, when the case reached the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, I think it was a unanimous decision. It was Schechter versus New York. And it was um, it was a, a unanimous decision. It's called the sick chicken case. Anybody that wants to look it up, just Google the sick chicken case. And the, I think they unanimously declared this law in violation of the Constitution. They were yes. essentially saying this fascist system has no place here in the United States. Now, another reason this, this is an important lesson, especially with respect to what we libertarians advocate, is that, as you know, Richard, today people say, oh, you can't just push the button uh, and repeal these government programs like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and the whole panoply of them. You can't just get rid of them all at once because there would be chaos. They, they have to gradually be reduced. Well, they were saying the same thing about the National Industrial Recovery Act, that, oh, there's too much dependency, the, there's codes are in existence, they affect businesses, industries all across the country, there would be chaos if you repeal them immediately. Well, on the day the Supreme Court declared that law unconstitutional, that pushed the button. That, that whole system of codes and regulations were, were gone immediately. And that really started an economic revival here in the United States. Yes. The, the only thing what we need to keep in mind is that the, the, the Supreme Court at that moment in 1936, uh, when it declared, uh, 35, 36, when it declared the New Deal uh, fascist legislations uh, it, through a sequence of, of cases coming before the Supreme Court, unconstitutional, almost always in unanimous or close to unanimous decisions, as, as, as profoundly important as that was um, in preventing America from being permanently straightjacketed into a literal fascist type economic system, uh, even with the, the abolition of those New Deal programs, the National Recovery Administration, Agricultural Adjustment Act, the fact is what, what, what the Supreme Court, particularly with a change in the turnover on the court soon after that, but the Supreme Court left in place and has been uh, the, 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 the poisoning element since then is that the right of the government still uh, uh, under the Commerce Clause to enter into and severely restrict, control, uh, prohibit, and regulate a vast amount of economic activities. The fact is Roosevelt continued uh, with, with, with his interventions in the economy, his huge public works projects, his, his budget deficits. And then particularly in the post-war period and accelerating since the 1960s on, this immense you know, network of, of regulatory agencies that, that if one looks at them just as a list, let's say in the World Almanac, many viewers and listeners may have a copy of the World Almanac on their shelf that you buy in the store. You know, it's available, a new one available every year. Just look at the, at, at the number of pages in small print of, of hundreds and hundreds of government agencies, bureaus and departments, each of which has some unique or overlapping with other agencies, responsibilities, duties and powers to, 
interfere with the economic and social and personal affairs of virtually every aspect of the American's life. But, but Jacob, sometimes I, I show the students in my classes, you know, the, 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 this, this like pages of government agencies, bureaus, and departments. And I contrast that with this, how, how much of the, of the U.S. government took up as pages in the first World War I Act that was published in, in 1868. Right, that was the first World War Act, like the one we buy in the grocery store. It was one page, Jacob. Wow. It was the cabinet positions, and that cabinet positions was like war and and the attorney general and uh, the, you know, justice. There was it was it was like like four or five cabinet positions, and then the and then the rest of the page are ambassadorships, right? Because you send ambassadors to represent the U.S. <laughs> at foreign countries, and that's it. It's one page. <laughs> wow. The cabinet positions and ambassadors. One page is the entire federal government in the World Almanac. That's now, amazing. Compared that to, like I said, the, these dozens of pages of, of a small print of one organization, bureau, department, or agency after another. I mean, what, what we, are, what we are in a, in a, in, in a straitjacket of these things. And, and that, is, is, that is the modern economic fascism through which America, and in fact most countries around the world, uh, tragically live today. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating. I mean, it really, you're absolutely right that there was some short-term victories there on the court, but it was like a tsunami. I mean, it's like having a little uh, a seawall that protects you against a rising tide, but then all of a sudden the tsunami comes in, and that seawall is not going to protect you. And it really was a tsunami of of statism that was that overwhelmed America in terms of the regulatory state and the the welfare state. And uh, and you're right. I mean, they're smothering us. It's ironic that in the Declaration of Independence, they they say that the British government, which was their own government, it wasn't a foreign government, had sent out all these officers that were eating out their substance. Well, gosh, that's what's happening today and has been happening for decades, that that all these officers in the bureaucracies and the politicians as well, they're they're eating out the substance of the nation, both on the welfare state side and the warfare state side, and of course on the regulatory state side, the drug war. I mean, it just goes on and on. In any event, Richard, we're out of time. Did, did you have to? Did you have any closing remarks you were about to make there? No, ju just just to reinforce the, the fact is is that uh, uh, our fellow citizens do do not always appreciate the the, the extent to which the tentacles of government reach out. And, 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 and envelop and strangle virtually every walk of life. You cannot get away from it. And that itself, if one appreciates it, shows the degree to which we live in a society in which freedom has been lost. Yeah, and, and the, the big problem, as I see it, is that they all think it is freedom, that they're convinced they do live in a free society. They, they epitomize what my favorite quote is, is the Goethe quote. They epitomize Goethe's quote that says, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. On that note, yes. Richard, we got to wrap it up. Good to see you this week again, and uh, see you next week. Until next time, bye-bye.